transistors? Transistors. Like, like, is like, that what you looked into? I, I thought we said transformers. Ah, uh, who like, is like, your favorite transformer? So I don't know if I'm mixing up transformers with another one, but the bad guy that would turn into the gun, or is that I auto? I don't know. Uh, that might be. I, I don't know. I, like Optimus Prime, it was the, the one bad, that turns the, into the truck. It was the or bad Bumblebee. Guy. It was, oh, it, was like, it was the opposite. I like Decepticons. I love the Decepticons. You would. You're so a that's bad what guy. all my research is based on is Transformers. It sounds and, like you did a lot of it if you don't even know Decepticons. And virtually any movie with Shia LaBeouf in it. So <laughs> is he still it, an actor? Because I, don't I think know. he like got in trouble or something. Yeah. So we're, it's not Transformers. It is not. It is Transistors. Oh, you're gonna be doing a, a lot of talking. <laughs> typically the case i have a fun fact for you to lead things off what do you say the transistor was invented in 1948 at bell telephone laboratories by william bill shockley john barden and walter bretain they won a nobel prize for this invention so if you haven't already why don't you go check out our episodes on alfred nobel the nobel prize as well as alexander graham bell Specifically, so, it was the 1956 Nobel Prize for Science. Was it? Yeah. See, I appreciate that because we've had, we've actually had guests on our show who won. We did. Uh, things like that. How crazy and, is that? Like, what about like all these people that win prizes like 50 years after the fact? That's a bunch of malarkey. Like, it I feel like malarkey. they're either dead or they've way earned it a long time before that. At least the transistors folks got it like yeah. at a reasonable time frame. Round right? about. Another fun fact about your fun fact. Oh, let's hear it. So these three cats. So you got you got Bill and John and who is the th- and who is Walt. the third and, and Walt. So and you Walt. Had, so apparently. These cats had a bit of a falling out. Like it was, it really? wasn't all like peas and carrots, you know, like Jenny and Forrest. I mean, it was apparently they were working together at uh, Bell Laboratory uh, whenever they were w- they were doing this in New Jersey. That may have been the problem because they I, were in New I Jersey. I think that's safe to assume. But. <laughs> they were constantly angry, uh, but <laughs> apparently there was a bit of dissension, and you know they 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 started it together, but then they all kind of went their separate ways and did different things, and there was a little bit of bad blood, from what I understand, between those guys. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to hear that because I really respected each and every one of them and their contributions to the transistor. Okay, so let's talk about what a transistor is, James. Before we do that, could I oh. talk a little bit about the predecessor to the transistor? Oh, of course you can. So before transistors existed, Luke, they were f- we first used vacuum tubes for these things. So a vacuum tube is basically like a glass bulb, kind of like the outside of an incandescent light bulb, okay. like kind of. Uh, but they consist of three parts, basically, a cathode, an anode, and the grid. And so how do they work, you might ask? How do they work, James? Thank you, Luke. Thank you for doing that for me. (laughs) An electrical current is passed through the cathode. And we've talked about this kind of stuff before, like with batteries and whatnot, heating it up and making it release electrodes. And these are attracted to the positively charged anode, uh, completing the circuit and the flow of electricity. So why bother doing this, you ask? Because you could just have electricity run through a wire, right? So. Thanks to the grid, you're able to manipulate the flow of these particles such that by using like kind of like a switch. So you're basically making this thing an on off switch. If you stick a light bulb on the other side of it, when a positive charge is applied, it will light up. But if you have a negative charge, the electrons are going to get repelled by that grid. And therefore, obviously the light bulb isn't going to light up. So this is basically all you need for binary coding. So all of those ones and zeros that you see when any any time anyone refers to binary code or yep. the matrix. The did matrix. You watch, did you watch the matrix? They were they were some of my favorite movies. Huh. Okay. Well, anyways, this is basically all coding is is these ones and zeros. Okay. Uh, fun fact for you, Luke. Shoot. The world's first general purpose computer named the ENIAC E N I A C used 18,000 vacuum tubes to do calculations. Ooh. Fun fact number two, and then I'm going to let you talk. Wow. Okay, ENIAC go. stands for, so E-N-I-A-C, it stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. 
very, very well named. Uh, but it was invented by some folks at the University of Pennsylvania for military use in 1945. Way to so, go, UPenn. Nice. Yeah, UPenn. So why did they invent this thing? To calculate the trajectory of artillery during World War II. I knew it was something related to war. <laughs> like, pretty much, when we've done any of this technology stuff, it all has some, either Everything. it starts or it makes its way. Just, come on, people, just be friendly. Just right. be friendly. That we don't need friendly. inventions. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All so, right. Moving on, Luke. Um, did you have a vacuum tube television? Are you old enough to have one of those way, way, way back in the day? I mean, maybe my parents did, but I okay. I wasn't of the age to understand if I did okay. or not. Okay. So let's talk about what a transistor is, James. A transistor is really simple, and at the same time, it's quite complex. So a transistor is essentially uh, a super miniature electronic component, and it does one of two things. It is either going to be an amplifier, so it's going to take the current that's coming in, you talk, you, you talk about the current, and it's going to mm -hmm. boost that current and amplify it, or it's going to be a switch, like you had mentioned, and it's going to turn something on or off. So let's talk about those two different things. So when it's working as an amplifier, uh, there's a tiny electric current at, at one end, we'll call this the input. And when it hits that transistor, it actually turns into a bigger current on the opposite side. So this is how you can take um, really low, like uh, the example I saw was the battery for a hearing aid. It's a super small battery. The, the amount of current in that battery is so incredibly low because the battery is really small. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it's powering, you know, a, a little, you know, uh, speaker essentially inside of that really small hearing aid that needs a higher signal oh. that normally would require a larger battery if you were going to supply it directly. So what the transistor does is it takes that low, um, th that low level of current and actually boosts it. So it can use a small battery and give a higher output. So it's kind of a, a current booster is, um, is one. Um, so you were talking about our boy, good old Willie Shockley, um, <laughs> one of the inventors. He actually had this humorous way of talking about what uh, a transistor does. And he says, uh, if you take a bale of hay and you tie it to the tail of a mule and you strike a match what? and hold, hold, you got to you got to hear me out. Hold on. This is how he explained what a transistor does. If you take a bale of hay and you tie it to the tail of a mule and you strike a match and set the bale of hay on fire. And if you compare the energy expended shortly after the mule with the energy expenditure, with you striking the match, that's the concept of amplification. So you striking the match is super what? easy, but the mule, <laughs> basically who you just lit on fire, is gonna go bananas and go crazy. So you have this really small amount of energy that then turns into this big amount of energy. It's a terrible, I, I just, I thought it was a funny, terrible explanation. A little animal cruelty going on there. <laughs> Willie. <laughs> just a little fun with animal cruelty. Like just PETA saying. doesn't hate us enough for our past <sighs> comments. Yeah, I know. Okay. So, so oh, 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 one more time. Mule, so, a mule. So well, only a mule. It can't be a cow or something. It has to be a mule. You take a bale of hay. You, you tie a bale on, of hay to you, it. To a mule. To you, its tail? You, uh, wherever. Like on, on its back. Okay, on its back. You strike a match. Because that doesn't take a lot of energy. Doesn't take a lot of energy. You light the hay on fire. It burns for a while. The energy comparison is what it took you to strike the match versus the reaction you're going to get from that mule you just lit on fire. Now, why couldn't we just think of it as like the bale of hay is on fire and all of that flame that results from it? Why does the poor mule need to get Apparently, caught on fire? Apparently, really doesn't like animals. He's okay. the kind of person you got to watch out for. I know, I know. Wow. So, so that's an amplifier. So the other thing a transistor does is it can be a switch. So okay. uh, a tiny electric current flowing through one part of a transistor can make a much bigger current uh, flow through another part. So in other words, that small current can switch on a larger one. And this is essentially, and that's what you just, you talked about earlier. Sure. That's what computers do, ones and zeros. It turns the zero to a one and vice versa. And that's essentially the basis of all computing is ones and zeros with transistors. So 
But there are no mules to go with this. <laughs> no, there, there are no mules to go with this. Uh, All right. So those are basically what they are. So before we go any further with that, Luke, I think we really need to take a break for a word well from our overdue. sponsor. And it is PETA? It is PETA in combination with <laughs> Texas Instruments, both not being our sponsor. Not no, we have no sponsors this Aww. week, but we do have a couple of shout outs and some we got? you know, interesting ones here. Our first shout out, I thought it was an email from Jesus, but it was not. It turns out it was an email from Jesus, which Jesus. the little line over the letter makes it different. It does uh, make it very different. He says in his whole email, Hey guys, you're doing a great job with your podcast. I really love it. Cheers from an electric engineering student from Spain. Uh, please send some stickers. And then he also included a little salsa dancing lady emoji and a peace symbol emoji. Now, did he do a Z for stickers? No, he did four S's though. Nice. So your stickers shall be in the mail eventually. Uh, I'm sorry it took me literally a month to write back to you. I have been very bad about this. When we go to Spain, we can stay with Jesus. That's right, we will. Um, second shout out Shoot. is from Bob W. We actually sent stickers to Bob W. back in the day. Okay. Uh, so thank you. He wore them proudly on his truck. These stickers of ours, for those of you who haven't seen them, are so sweet that somebody stole his truck just to get them. <laughs> yeah. He also suggested that we do an episode on BattleBots, which I love that idea. Do you remember that TV show, BattleBots? I oh, love that TV show. So I have a lot of background with BattleBots as well that I could okay. discuss during that episode. So Ooh, I yeah. love it, Bob. And I am sending him more sweet stickers so that his next ride can get stolen as well. Perfect. So uh, I feel pretty good about our stickers right now. But I, I do, do too. feel a little bad about Bob. Yeah, um, yeah. If any of you would like your car or truck stolen, uh, why don't you email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com and I will send you some stickers for you to put on your vehicle and it will inevitably be stolen because Guaranteed. they are that cool. Fact. Yeah, fact. Also, make sure you subscribe, make sure you like, make sure you share, yell at your smart devices to play unprofessional engineering and we will be beamed into your ear holes. Ear holes. Let's All move those on. Things. Moving on. Uh, Luke, did you know that transistors have shrunk a whole bunch over time? Like a lot. Like a lot is the technical so, term. So do you know what the typical size is of a single transistor? Do you, do you have that number in front of you, James? Boy, I do not. It is 50 atoms wide or 22 nanometers. That feels very small. I think a nanometer is about a quarter inch, so... You know. Oh, okay, that's pretty small. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. That, I think that it sounds... It so sounds do you know why way. they're so small? It's because of what they're made of. What are they made of, Luke? So a transistors, uh, so they are made of the most abundant material on the face of the earth, and that is silicon. Um, <laughs> is that which, actually the most abundant material? I'm pretty sure it is. If it's not, I could just be making that up. Okay, we're going to go with that as fact, but let's there's hear the a, rest of this. There's a lot on the beaches, that's all I'm saying, because it's basically sand. It's basically um, sand. And what it is, is it's, it's an interesting material because it's considered a semiconductor. And it is. What a semiconductor means is it's neither a conductor nor an insulator by default. So whenever you take silicon, it, it's, it's this kind of neutral material. So steel is, or, or metal is very conductive and, you know, marshmallows aren't, whatever the other material happens to be. Yeah, so these semiconductors, it's like they'll conduct, but then as you introduce impurities into the structure, that means- It's called that's where doping, actually, the doping. impurities. Doping. You know who's a big fan of semiconductors is Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Lance, it's funny. One of the websites had a picture of Lance Armstrong and they were talking about doping. Did they really? Uh, they did. They did. Oh, I'm so, so clever. So typically, what you do when you're making this with these with with, with these really thin um, sheets of silicon, basically, because basically you're making a sandwich, is what you're making. Mm, man, uh, I so love sandwiches. There are two types. There is an N type or negative type, and there's a P type, positive type, and it's kind of a misnomer that it means positive and negative because they're really not positively charged and negatively charged. It's just how the atoms are arranged and th they just do it for simplicity's sake. Can I discuss the atom arrangement a little oh, bit? I, I, before you do that, let me talk about how you make an N-type and how you make a P-type. Oh, so if you, if, really you want, if you want an N-type, 
you add arsenic, phosphorus, or antimonium. You add that impurity to it by doping. That makes it an, an N type. Or antimonium? Do you mean animantium, like with Wolverine's claws? I think that's what <laughs> Okay. A-N-T-I-M-O-N-Y, whatever that is. I'm a bad okay. speller. Okay, okay. Or pronouncer. Uh, and if you want to make a P-type or positive, you add boron, uh, gallium, or uh, aluminum. There we go. So let's I talk like it. about the electron, proton, neutron. All the tons. The neutron dance. Let's talk about it. All right. So I'm warning. I've probably warned people about this before. I am not very good at chemistry. Nope. And I don't know much about this stuff, but I'm going to try my best, Luke. And Shoot. you know what? That's going to be good enough, I think. Your best always is. Thank you. So apparently silicone, silicon, silicone. I, There's I no E, con. so silicon. I'm going to say, say silicon. Con. It has four electrons in its valence shell, which is apparently like the outside shell with the yep. electrons swirling around, right? But it wants eight to be stable. So that's cool. This means though that silicon forms covalent bonds, and I remember those from high school, I remember the term, with mm -hmm. other silicon to be stable. So it's all nice and matched up, right? Now if you add something into the mix, just like you were talking about, like, like say phosphorus is one of the examples you gave, uh, it has, that has a bonus fifth electron, right? Mm -hmm. So now you stick this oddball in there. With all of these fours, you stick a five in there, and this means that there's going to be a free, a free electron just kind of roaming around, making things negatively charged. There's movement now. There's movement, yes. And this is the N-type semiconductor that you were talking about. So then if you add something else like boron, it only has three electrons. And you named, there were a few other things in there as well, and they have mm -hmm. the same kind of properties. Uh, it only has three electrons. And so this means that you get something positively charged. The boron tries to steal electrons from all of its neighbors and thus produces this uh, positive charge. This is the p-type of semiconductor. Mm -hmm. And so then to get things wild and crazy, Luke, wild and crazy. Wild and crazy. Uh, if you line these suckers up and attach terminals to each of the semiconductors, you get the most common type of transistor, the NPN transistor. And all, and this basically is all based on the changes in electrons going on through these different things. Mm -hmm. And so this works because the extra electrons of the n-type go in and fill all of those holes that are in the p-types that we talked about, and form what smart people call a depletion layer, which is really fancy, right? And this is a fancy term for it prevents the electrons from passing through. They can't go uh, from one side of the transistor to the other. Correct. So if a positive charge is applied to one of the terminals, it negates this depletion layer. It just kind of disappears. And this allows the electrons to flow through once again from pew, one pew, side pew. to the next. That's the exact noise. If you, if, you put a, if you put a stethoscope up to a transistor, that's what you hear. That is. Two fun facts for you, Luke. Shoot. Fun fact numero uno. And that's thanks to Jesus writing in and teaching me Spanish. There you go. Uh, transistors were first made of germanium, but were later replaced by silicon since germanium breaks down at a mere 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So it wasn't super reasonable to make them out of that material. Okay. Fun fact number two about Those. the same thing, Texas Instruments actually made the first silicon transistor, but not for a calculator, which is pretty disappointing. It is. If you haven't, though, why don't you check out our episode on companies that built the world? Texas Instruments. Exactly. You'll find out about how they don't just make calculators, which is a total bummer. It is a bummer. Um, yeah. So before we go on with all of the great information in your brain or what's left after your traumatic head injury. I know. How about you go ahead and do this week's Luke's rant? So this rant has to do with... Uh, what I'm calling the price of process. So whenever you go to buy a computer, and, and I had to do this recently, and if you're buying, I, I'm not a Mac person, I, I use an iPhone, but basically I'm a, a PC person. So when you uh -huh. go to the store and you're looking at PCs, you're like, oh, there's this computer, and it's like $300 or $400, this laptop, let's say. And you look, it has the crappiest, slowest processor you could ever imagine. Then you want to get like a better processor, like you want the i9 or you want whatever it is. All of a sudden, this $300 computer, mind you, this is 
essentially the exact same computer, but just with a higher end processor, all of a sudden it's like $400 more. So it, it's literally a different chip and that's all that it is. So my rant is this is literally like I quoted the fact, the most abundant resource on the face of the earth, silicon. And they're just charging. I mean, there's literally like, I, I get there's more processing power. Now. I, I get there's more transistors in there. I, I, and we're going to do a fun game later where James has to guess how many transistors are in things. But why is going from a slow processor to a fast processor that much more expensive? I mean, it, it, the math is done. The engineering is done. The, it, it, it's not any more expensive for them to make a, a fast processor versus a slow processor. And if it is, I can't imagine it's worth the cost difference. Luke, what did you call this? The price of... The price of processing. Price of processing. Man, if I didn't know better, I would say that you have been thinking that one up for like a week or two It now just hit me, Because that was so good. Yeah. Uh, let me, I actually let me... wrote it down just two seconds ago. The price of processing. Oh, there it is. Good job on an envelope too. It's like designing something on the back of a napkin. Yeah. Uh, let me try and help you with answering your rant. How about okay. that? Shoot. Intel co-founder Gordon Moore. Do you know Gordon? Oh, yeah, Gordy. We go way back. Yeah, he used to be the Gordon's fisherman, but that was his first career. <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, he found that the density of transistors on integrated circuits doubles every two years. And this happened until just recently. So that that's crazy? like a lot of power, right? But why is it slowing down? Because kind of like you're pointing out, it's crazy expensive Like to keep doing this. Crazy, crazy expensive. The cost of manufacturing the devices doubles every four years. So, you know, we're doubling up the number of uh, transistors on the integrated circuits every two years. Every four years, though, it's doubling the cost of manufacturing. So it just isn't sustainable to keep up at this pace. Yeah. So you're right. It's super expensive for us to buy, but it's also super expensive for them to develop this technology. But the good news for you is Intel is basically saying, hey, this has hit a, a point where it is no longer fe- like reasonable for us to be improving it anymore. So to me, it sounds like there's some room for some new technology just to come in and replace this stuff. Doesn't totally that sound agree. About I right? think we go back to vacuum tubes. Yeah, we should go back to vacuum tubes. Fun but, fact yeah, about Intel. Uh-huh. Uh, so our, our, our boy, Willie Shockley set up his own transistor making company, uh, after he left Bell Laboratories, uh, and, and, and this, and he did this in Palo Alto, California. Oh, Palo Alto. It's called Silicon Valley. It is. Um, and two of his, two of his employees of that company he started, uh, Robert Noyce, I think is how you say his name. I think, you know, I say noise instead of nice. Kids I mean, I days. always say that. Yeah. Uh, and then Gordon Moore, these two cats went on to found Intel, the world's biggest microchip processor, actually worked for Willie Shockley. Really? Talk about the connections there. Man, small world in that no Silicon kidding. Valley. Interesting. Uh, so there's another problem with these transistors being other added on. Oh. Other than, well, other than the price, but... Just the number and the size of them as well is also a problem. And that problem is called quantum tunneling, Luke. Quantum tunneling. Now, we have a rule here at Unprofessional Engineering that once quantum comes into play, unless we're talking about quantum leap, we don't get involved. One of the best television shows of all time. My goodness, there was so much leaping done in a quantum fashion. Yes. But in this case, I'm going to make just a tiny exception. So this quantum tunneling thing basically means that the transistors are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that means the barriers between the different sections, like all of the different atoms that we talked about, Mm -hmm. is also getting smaller, right? That means the depletion layer that we talked about that stops things from flowing or allows things to flow through, that's getting so thin that electrons can pass through them. Or in other words, the transistor doesn't work and it's useless. So it's almost like this technology is getting to a point that it can't really be improved on that much more without making a significant change. And Intel is actually decreasing its efforts now on increasing the speeds of their chips, and they're more focusing on decreasing the power consumption that's used Uh, on them. And probably like net new technology. 
Pro- well. Probably n- new technology and podcast sponsorships, I assume. I, I'm guessing podcast sponsorships. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, one can only guess that's where the money is. I, I assume as much. So I had a whole section on binary code. It's really boring. It's ones and zeros, and I teach you how to do the math, but it could either be its own episode or we could just never talk about it. What do you think? I'm fine with never talking about it. The only thing I have left is I have our how many transistors are in game. I want to hear the game. I'm really looking forward to it. And then I have some fun facts for us. Okay, so here we go, James. Um, And I only have three. You only have to get one of these within a billion. So, you, so your, your, margin, a billion. Yeah, your margin of allowable error is a billion. Looking at my fun facts, I might have some of these numbers, okay. but go ahead. In an iPhone 11, oh, jeepers. how many transistors are there? In an 11, is that like the really big one? It's, or it's, it's is the it the newest? newest? It's the newest one. So, and, and, and again, this is on the interwebs, so this could be totally wrong, but based off of my crack research, what's the number? Considering that computer I talked about had 18,000 vacuum tubes and took up a whole room, I'm going to say the phone has 2 billion? Nope. An iPhone 11 has roughly 8.5 billion transistors in it. So I was only like 4x off, a little be, more. You had, to be, you had to be by a billion. Gosh, okay. that's just not fair. Go ahead, okay. next. Next. So <laughs> you're, you're O and O. Uh, or 0 and 1 or whatever. We haven't played a game in a while. I'm not good at this. Uh, Yeah, 0 for 1. So uh, the i9 processor, the Intel i9 I9 processor has how many transistors in it? i9. The 9 means nothing. I'll give you a hint. (laughs) Well, I feel like it's probably... Better than what's in an iPhone. I don't know. The iPhone, that A whatever chip is a pretty impressive chip that they make. I feel like you're trying to mislead me, Luke. I'm, uh, and I forget how much, dang it, how much you said. I'm going to go with 11 billion. No, the 9 only has 1.736 oh, billion. Oh, come on. That's a trick question. Okay, 0 oh and 2. This is the <laughs> last one. This is for all the marbles, James. You get this one right, you're redeemed. Okay, I got this. How many transistors are in the world? Oh, <laughs> and I still have to be within a billion? You can be within a sextillion. I don't even know what that is. I'm <laughs> going to say one times 10 to the 937th power. I, I don't know what that means, but here's how many. And again, this is a total estimate um, that they said were shipped since the invention of the transistor. <laughs> Uh, so it's two nine one three two six seven three two seven five six seven eight nine zero 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 zero. That's two point nine sextillion. To give that some perspective, yeah, yeah. What's that? There's only two billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, oh, and there's man. only a hundred trillion cells in the human body. You know what I could go for is a Twix. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't stand Milky Ways. Worst uh, candy bar ever. They're not the best. Check out our candy bars episode. Oh, uh, you really should. That's a good one. Um, so you, well, that was you a lot. failed Luke. terribly. I failed terribly, but I really don't feel that bad about that last you one. You shouldn't. And also, when you were saying, like, it's an estimate, I felt like it would be a lot less exact than that because there were a lot of non-zero numbers involved in whatever oh, you were yes. just saying. Oh, yes. I'm not sure who did that, but whoever did was – their estimate was a pretty specific estimate. Yeah. All right. So a couple fun facts for you. Shoot. The original Pentium processor released by Intel back in 92 had over 3 million transistors, and that was a big number back then. So things have obviously How many? changed. Three million with okay. an M, not with a B. Uh, the original transistor built by Bell Labs in 1947 was large enough that it was pieced together by hand. By contrast, more than 100 million 22 nanometer trigate transistors, that's kind of like the common uh, transistor, could fit on the head of a pin now. So the other first one being built by hand. Uh, more than 6 million 22 nanometer trigate transistors could fit in the period at the end of a sentence. Uh, that's that's kind of neat. Um, a 22 nanometer trigate transistor 
is so small you could fit more than 4,000 of them across the width of a human hair. Not the length of a human hair, the width of a human hair. I, I, that, that's, that can't be right. Isn't that crazy, Tam? Um, and I'm going to skip ahead because I know we're just at time. The third generation Intel Core processor, quad core, contained 1.48 billion transistors. If transistors were people, Intel's chip has more transistors than the population of China. I, 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 I how can't is even that a thing? Like, how do you how do you make that? Like physically, like how do you how do you assemble? I, I. I feel like that's something we really should have looked into. And I have all of that research down in my notes, but unfortunately we're out of time, yeah. Luke. Maybe that's like a heck how of a they're question. physically made, like, like with that mechanical, like, cause these, it, it, it's, it's a mechanical thing. It has no moving parts. It's all just driven through, you know, current, but, but they're still think assembled. they just like shoot atoms at it? Like how do you get such a small imperfection then in the I silicon to make know. it happen? Well, I don't know. I know I don't usually admit this, but there are one or two smarter people than me out there in the world. And fortunately they have figured this stuff out. This is also, this, this falls in like that black magic category for me. Yeah, like, for it's sure. Just like, it's like really like I type on my keyboard and all of a sudden there's words on my screen. It's just and that's somehow terrible. it was ones and zeros not yeah. long before that. Yeah. yeah. It's somehow that that's, that's black magic. So. Black magic. I agree. Well, if all of you agree that this is black magic, or maybe you have an answer for us on how these things are actually made because we're not going to Google it any further. Why don't nope. you email us at, unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. Let us know your episode suggestions. Tell us we're doing a great job. Tell us we're doing a terrible job. Or, you know, just ask for some stickers. Either way, hopefully you enjoyed the episode. And until next time, see ya.